I was born in Los Angeles in 41 and uh, into a family who were in the arts. My father was a filmmaker, my mother painted. And uh, I was always encouraged to be a painter. I wanted to be a filmmaker at one time. And then after 61, I decided I wanted to be a painter because in 61, I met various people in a, a kind of art school in Yale in the summer. And I met people who became my lifelong friends, really, and, and got very excited about painting. In those days, uh, painting was a very important art in a way, more than it is now, maybe. And uh, I decided that when I had finished my school and I'd finished going to Europe and finished being in the army a little bit, then I would come back to New York and live and work, which is what happened. The, the people I met in the summer, the summer school, my closest friend was Bryce Martin, who's been my friend all these years. And Chuck Close was there. I'm just telling you the names of the well-known ones. Uh, Chuck and Bryce, who were, you know, I was younger than most of the people there. I was a couple of years younger than them. And uh, it was great. We were allowed to just paint and not be disturbed. It was in, out in the countryside. And it was when I realized I wanted to be a painter because uh, I was tired of the film business because it involved too many people, too much telling people what to do. Uh, and I didn't get turned on by it, but then I got really excited by painting. And I got excited by seeing it first in the uh, museums in New York, which were superior to anything in Los Angeles. So I could go to the Met and the Modern Museum, which was very important to me that, in that summer of 61. And then uh, it got me very excited about going to Europe. And in going to Europe, I, I really developed as an artist. That's where I first became a painter, in my opinion. I feel very strongly about the essential nature of painting, that the activity is a kind of ancient and extremely honorable activity with a, a wonderful history and not just in the West, but all over the world, it's a great universal expression. Whereas art doesn't mean anything. Art is really a word that suggests value. For instance, uh, that cook is a gr great artist. <laughs> so you can call a cook an artist, and that's okay. You know, that's all right. But you can't call somebody an artist who just says they're an artist and they make art. I, for me, Saying you're a painter is, is the important thing. To identify yourself within the tradition of, of, of painting. Just as if I were a sculptor, I'd say, well, I'm a sculptor. And that would give me another context to, in which to live, to exist, what to believe in, or an architect, or maybe all of those. But you can't just say I'm an artist, because that's almost like saying I'm great. <laughs> you know? I am an artist. <laughs> You know, uh, I'd rather just be a painter and fit in somehow in the history of painting. This question is at the center of the problem about talking about painting. Because when people want me to identify a specific painter or painters, that suggests that I'm interested in that idea about painting. I'm not. There are certainly wonderful painters in history whose names you know, who I, I, I've been extremely moved by ever since I was a child. You know, uh, Cezanne, in more contemporary times, Rothko, Pollock, like that. But really, most of the painting that I've I'm, I'm been influenced by and inspired by is by made by people whose names you don't even know before the Renaissance in, in the United States. Or in China, there are people whose names I wouldn't be able to pronounce correctly, for instance, when I first saw them. It, it, it's about the experience of painting, 
not the individual in a funny way. And so this idea that painting progresses in some way and goes from A to Z in a regular line and one thing is in another, that's a particularly Western uh, concept about advancing in the arts that I don't accept. So if I like the cave paintings, almost better than anything, say the cave paintings in Neo I've seen or in Spain or in Lascaux, then whose name do I tell you? All I can say is I like the cave paintings who were made 30, 40,000 years ago. And then you have to know something about those paintings to understand why I like them. And then if I say to you, I also like Egyptian wall painting, then you have to know something about that. But I wouldn't be able to tell you the names of the people that made them. I can only identify the period or the, the caves in China with the great paintings. What all these things have in common are that they were made in a place, for a place, and for a use you know, of some kind. And uh, that's been the greatest inspiration for me, that the painting should be made for a specific site. So mural art has been very powerful in my development. Not just painting, but also mosaics in places like the Alhambra or, or Ravenna. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it's made out of. The idea of identifying a place and an image together has been the thing that's moved me the most. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean I don't like Titian and I don't like Cezanne and I don't like, you know, but it's not the primary essence of my interest. And I essentially like painting prior to the Renaissance. Yeah, well, I was making something that didn't have any resale value. I, I, the kind of art that, the kind of painting that I wanted to make was commissioned for a site. And I was very naive and I assumed that once I made the thing, it would just stay there and never leave. But unfortunately, in our culture, you know, things get destroyed, buildings are put up and taken down. So a great deal of my work doesn't exist anymore uh, that I made. Now, as for the galleries, when I first began, uh, I wasn't able to get commissions. So I had to invent a kind of way of painting that could be seen in a gallery. And so I in invented what I thought was a sort of portable mural, which were made out of pieces like this. And you could set it up in a site. I would make it for a specific site. So they weren't, you know, generalized, but they were also not permanent for that site. That way I could show in the galleries, and I did that for about seven or eight years. And I, you know, quite happily, no problem. And then uh, in 1970, Don Judd, who is a friend of mine, uh, and who lived nearby, said, I know that you want to make fresco, paint in fresco directly on the wall, and I have this building, so why don't you come and do that, and I'll give you a space to do it. So I did, and that was the first time I did it. I, although I continued showing in the galleries for another four or five, six years after that, I essentially concentrated on making these sorts of projects. And uh, that's what I did until, I'm still doing it. I, I do this exhibition, but my main in, interest has been in these large, large scale painted walls. I don't want it to appear that I'm saying that the only reason I stopped showing in galleries or started showing in galleries had to do with my interest physically in the wall, although that was the primary issue in, in my mind. But it coincided very neatly with my political point of view, which was anti-capitalist, essentially. I disliked the idea of painting being turned into a product. I disliked the idea of the validation of painting by the marketplace. And I still do. I feel that this has been one of the really dangerous and bad things about the way painting has been seen and is being made today, and, and especially uh, in the universal art world that's controlled by enormous uh, money interests. And uh, if I go on like this, I'll sound like a politician, a political track. And uh, although I'll stop now, I want it to be clear that I think that the importance of money 
and value of a thing based only on money has been one of the most damaging elements in the development of painting for the last at least 50 years. Well, when you, you, uh, you being Tomas Brambilla, first uh, came to see me and you wanted to work and do something, uh, I had begun to <coughs> think more about showing in galleries again after not doing it for a long time. I'd been showing with Paula Cooper and uh, it, <coughs> it coincided with these thoughts of mine. So it, it was kind of a perfect moment. Uh, I won't go in too much detail about my romantic feelings about Italy and my history of having come here as a, as a young man, as a 20 year old, and seeing you know, all the great mural painting and uh, mosaics and all the things that really started me on my direction, including Giotto, including Piero, including Ravenna, including et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I mean, there's too much even to begin talking about not to mention the, the single painters, the Titians and the Carpaccio and all of that. So, I mean, it's, it's just too much to talk about my feels, feeling for Italian painting. It's very intense. So I like the idea of coming here to do an exhibition. Then you showed me pictures of your gallery and I thought, oh, the gallery. And at the same time, uh, I, had, I had wanted to make paintings on canvas of ideas that I'd already done in the past. All of these paintings are remakes in a funny way. I, when I say remakes, I don't want that to be misunderstood. They're not copies. But in each case almost, the original paintings were destroyed. And I decided oh, a few years ago that I didn't want to make any more right angle paintings. But at the same time, I wanted to have a record of this group of paintings that I'd made. So, I made, I redid them with some kind of references to the old paintings. I made this painting, for instance, as a boathouse mural, and that I did in 2000. Well, I had a falling out with the man who made it. It's possible that, for all I know, that the painting doesn't exist anymore. Then I remade it as a fresco for a friend in Los Angeles, and that house was sold, and that painting is now destroyed. So I thought, ah, well, I like this image. What am I going to do? So I make a canvas version. And that's what this is. Then uh, the one on the other wall was from a painting I made when I lived in New Mexico in the 70s, early 70s. And that got destroyed in, in one way or another. So I remade that because I liked it. The painting on the right was an idea I had in 2000. And I never got a chance to make it, so I made that here. And the only kind of one I made initially for this exhibition is the one called K, it's in the front. And I did that because I'd been wanting to make that kind of a painting for a while too. But now that I've made these, it's unlikely that I'll make any more paintings using this kind of right angle format or this way, because for a number of years now, I think since the eight, mid eighties, I've been painting in another form, a kind of a looser, uh, looser form, a non right angle form. And I want, I've been using that in conjunction with the right angle images because I'm interested in the idea of the painting that has what's always referred to as the decorative, like a border in a medieval painting, for instance. Then the image is seen as somehow different from that and perhaps more important. But for me, it wasn't. It was the connection between the two. So I thought, well, I'll continue making this kind of painting and the other kind of painting and combine them in these mural cycles that I wanted to do, which is what I've done. It's, I've been doing that now for a long time. And as I say, I've made these last right angle paintings. This uh, metal painting, this study for a, a kind of a niche painting is uh, something I made in 75 and I've never been able to make it. I thought of, at the time of, actually I was, I was thinking a lot about painting this in, on the side of a mountain, how you would do that. And uh, I won't make any reference to Bamiyan or Buddhas that have been blown up or any of that. But it was in my mind. And also, since I lived in New Mexico and I'd seen a lot of cliff painting, rock painting, stuff on the sides of walls, that was influencing me as well.
So, I was saying, uh, you were asking me about the copper paintings uh, that are in the San Lupo Oratorio. Now, I had said before that I lived in New Mexico, and originally from the late 60s through the beginning of the, the 70s, and uh, I had left and gone back to New York. And I had a friend named Richard Dant, Buck Dant, who still lived there. And when I got a commission to do a project in uh, Newark in New Jersey, I designed a, a triptych. It was 13 feet tall, and it moved. The side walls opened and closed using a solar collector that was on the roof. And my friend, Buck, helped me and designed that system for me and helped me fabricate the aluminum panels so that when the sun came up, the panels opened, and when the sun came down, they closed. Now that painting stayed there for a long time and everything worked very well. Then after the uh, bombing of the World Trade Center, the people in this train station decided they wanted to make a patriotic gesture. So they unplugged the uh, mechanism that opened and closed my painting and put a wall over it and put two American flags like this. So the painting disappeared. It was no longer visible. And it was only 10 or 12 years later that I found out what had happened. And by then it was too late. They weren't going to ever put it back the way it was. So I'm only mentioning this to show you what happens to these projects. Meanwhile, my friend Buck was building these earth houses in the Galisteo Basin in New Mexico, which was a different part of the New Mexico area than I, than I had lived in. I used to live up in the north in the Chama Valley. And this Galisteo Basin area is a huge bowl that's separated by a series of mountain ranges. And I went there and stayed in his house because he had gone to Europe and uh, he let me stay there with my wife and child, and we lived there for the summer. Now, I, when I went initially, I didn't have any idea about making something or what I would make, but when I got there, I began making drawings of the area, in a way, in my mind, and I decided that I would try to make some things out of exploded copper. Now, down the road lived a blacksmith, and when we met and I told him about my ideas, he said he too had wanted to use explosives to make some doors for his, his studio. So we decided to go together on this. And uh, the, I was able to buy copper sheets, three by nine sheets, that were sent out from Albuquerque to Los Alamos. So the truck would stop and drop off my copper in the middle of nowhere. And my friend and I would pick it up and I drew on them and cut them out in the shape I wanted. And then I discovered a, a store that sold pans that had been used for gold mining, also out of copper. And I thought that was interesting and it related to what I was doing. This area, the mountains around this area had been mined for gold. So I bought the pans and I cut out holes and I inserted them or put them the other way around. And I made these kind of forms. As for the explosion that made the linear uh, projection onto the, onto the drawing. I used something that's called line charge, which is like a, a very heavy duty fuse. And that was con taped down to the copper and then connected to a, a trunk line. And the trunk line was taken around the mountain and connected to a truck battery. And that was blown up. I knew something about this because I'd been in the artillery when I was in the army. So I knew sort of how you handled uh, the materials and what, it, what was involved. But it was still not a good idea. We did it anyway, it was dangerous. <laughs> but I liked the results very much. And then after they were blown up, they formed this sort of curvilinear projection around the line. And I began painting on them. And I had to re relate the painting to the kind of inconsistencies of the shape, the non-planar elements, and I found that very exciting. So I made these paintings, and uh, I showed them once in New York, sort of more or less immediately. They, it was like pissing in the wind. They were just invisible, you know. Nobody cared about them much or saw them even. And so I put them away again. 
And then when Thomas came to see me about these exhibitions and mentioned the oratorio, I thought, ah, this would be just the right place for these weird one-off paintings that I'd made. And so that's how they came to be here in Bergamo.